Valvular heart disease is defined by the valve that it is that is affected. So any of our heart valves can be affected with mitral valve disease, but the most common ones that are affected are our mitral valve and our aortic valve. And the alterations are classified as either stenosis, which is narrowing, or regurgitation, which is backflow. So as we look at some of the images here of valves, a normal valve, you could see how it opens and closes. If the valve is stenosed, so we have a stenosed valve here, the valve orifice, orifice is restricted and forward blood flow is impeded. When we have regurgitation, there's incomplete, incomplete closure of the valve leaflets and this results in a backflow of blood. Diagnostic purposes, there may be multiple tests that are done on a patient to rule out valvular heart disease, um, but some uh, specific things that will give us a little bit of information will be an echocardiogram. That's going to give us some specific information on the valve structure, how it functions. It's also going to give us information about the chamber size. An ECG is really going to give us more of the rhythm and ischemia that a person might um, have experienced. So it doesn't really give us valve information, but it gives us some cardiac information. Same with a chest x-ray or CT scan. It's going to give us um, some information about the size of the heart, if maybe they're having some cardiomegaly, um, cardiomyopathy, but that's not going to tell us um, specifically about the valve. A cardiac cath, though, will be able to measure the pressures of the valve and the size of the valve opening. So that's going to be able to give us the most specific information. There might also be some lab work done. Um, for example, a white blood cell count might be done, and that might be looking more um, to rule out any type of infection, because if we do have someone who has a valve problem, they could be at risk for endocarditis, or uh, if someone has endocarditis, they are at risk for developing valve problems. Now, when we look at patients who have valve disorders, there's going to be some very specific signs and symptoms that someone's going to have, um, whether they have, let's say, mitral valve stenosis or aortic valve stenosis, so they'll be different. So these assessment findings here are kind of more just general findings that you might find with someone who has valve problems. If you want to know uh, the very specific ones, and you'll want to refer to your textbook. So... Um, because we're having a valve problem, you would anticipate that the person is going to have some type of um, cardiovascular abnormal findings. For example, there may be abnormal heart sounds. You may be able to hear murmurs. Um, they may be having some tachycardia or some different dysrhythmias, and you might see some hypotension. Patients with heart failure, or excuse me, patients with um, valve problems often then experience heart failure and heart failure symptoms. Because if you think about the fact that we have someone who has either problems with blood flow moving forward or blood flow backing up, um, we might see someone with respiratory problems such as crackles, wheezes, or hoarseness. If we have someone who is in fluid volume overload, we can also see some hasites and some hepatomegaly from that um, extra fluid. There can be skin problems as well, um, diaphoresis related to our decreased cardiac output, peripheral edema related to our um, fluid volume excess. We can see different, different um, problems with temperature and clubbing, which would be due to chronic hypoxia, which could happen related to um, abnormal heart rhythms, heart failure, fluid volume overload, um, a, couple of, a couple of different things. When we think about the treatment for heart failure patients, we're really trying to prevent any of those heart failure exacerbations. So all of the, the things that you learned about caring for the heart failure patient would apply to your patient who has a valve disorder. Uh, we also have to worry about pulmonary edema, again, because of the risk for fluid volume overload, so really good lung assessments, thinking about how we treat pulmonary edema. Anytime we have blood flow that is pooling um, in uh, the heart, we run the risk of blood clots developing which puts them at risk for thromboembolisms. And anyone who has a valve disorder is at risk for developing endocarditis. There will be a variety of medications or drug therapy that could be used for this patient. 
Again, it will be a little bit more specific based on their other comorbidities and other um, cardiac conditions, but we might see digitalis or digoxin being used to increase the contractility of the heart, diuretics to help decrease that fluid volume overload, antidysrhythmic or antiarrhythmics or antidysrhythmics if they are experiencing any dysrhythmias. Uh, beta blockers can slow down the heart rate, so they can be used for multiple reasons. Beta blockers can be used to help prevent heart failure exacerbations, prevent MI, slow down heart rate, help with some dysrhythmias. They really help uh, improve the efficiency of the heart. Anticoagulants might be important. So again, if we're worried about blood pooling um, in the atrium or the ventricle of the heart, we're, we want to put them on anticoagulants to prevent um, any risk of clots, which could then lead to something more serious like a pulmonary embolism or a um, stroke. Antibiotics, um, we might need to talk about antibiotics as well, more in a prophylactic reason. So patient teaching will include if they are on anticoagulants, they'll need to know all the information about anticoagulant teaching. They'll need to know about prophylactic antibiotic use and so um, typically any invasive procedure that a patient is having who has a valve problem they should be taking prophylactic antibiotics, which will help prevent them from um, acquiring uh, infective endocarditis. All the other teaching would be very similar to that heart failure patient again. So all that cardiac teaching you've learned already. And again, thinking about activity modifications, this might be a person who needs oxygen. We really want them to avoid infection because we're worried about that risk of infective endocarditis which then could lead to increased mortality and morbidity for this patient. Avoiding stress and fatigue will be important. Rest will be important. So kind of figuring out how you're going to alternate rest and activity because we still want them to have some activity, but it might be, uh, you know, they might not be running 20 minutes on a treadmill every day. It might be that they're walking five minutes around in their apartment. So that will have to be based on um, your individual patient. Hygiene will be important. We'll want to have good oral care, um, good skin care, good hygiene, just again, overall preventing any infection because we do not want to get infective endocarditis. They should definitely know the signs and symptoms of infection, any type of infection, and should be seeing their doctor immediately if they started having any signs and symptoms of, let's say, a respiratory infection, GI infection. Uh, they need to make sure they're following up with their provider as directed. And as I previously said, we, we would include all the previous cardiac teaching we did, so including diet, meds, activity, all of that. Now there's a couple different options um, for surgical uh, means if the patient, if you know they're not being managed well enough with medications, if the disease is too severe. Valve repair would, is typically the surgical procedure of choice, but if they don't qualify for valve repair, um, then valve replacements might be required. And valve replacements come in both mechanical and biological. So a mechanical valve is going to be long-lasting, so it will last longer. But one thing we have to remember is that they need to be on anticoagulation therapy um, for the rest of their life. Biological valves, um, they can wear out. There's less chance for clot formation than with mechanical valves because it's not, a for it's not made of a foreign material. Um, the biological valves are made of the same... Um, collagen that is used that our, our valves are made up of and so they don't because it with a bio, biological valve although they might wear out the person does not need anticoagulation so they need to take a minute now and think about well who would be a better candidate for which type of valve so there's certain patients who could never get a mechanical valve because they couldn't be on anticoagulation so that might be somebody who has a high risk for bleeding um, someone who has a, a, a bleeding disorder, for one, definitely. Um, anybody who has high risk for injury. So if you think about someone who maybe has um, epileptic seizures, if they're at risk for falling and injury hitting their head, um, they would not be appropriate to be on um, anticoagulant therapy. Any patient who has high risk for injury, high risk for falls, so uh, maybe a younger patient, although you might think you want a mechanical valve because it will last longer, but if you think about a child who's falling down or an adolescent who wants to play contact sports, those types of things, uh, being on anticoagulant would not be appropriate. 
also remembering that anybody who is childbearing age, if a female patient is thinking about having a child, you cannot be on an anticoagulant and sustain a pregnancy. So those are just a couple of things to think about when you're thinking about who might be more appropriate for um, either type of valve. And so if we have someone who does need mechanical valves and they're on Coumadin or Warfarin, um, there's a couple important things to remember about this particular drug. So uh, it is an anticoagulant. It does um, significantly, significantly increase somebody's risk for bleeding, bruising, um, you know, definitely internal hemorrhage if they were to have some type of traumatic injury. Uh, if the levels do become high, too high, there are reversal agents, so that would be your vitamin K. And don't get that confused with potassium, which is KCL. People get that confused a lot, um, but it's different. And then fresh frozen plasma. Um, other alternatives that might be used for patients um, who also have AFib might be Pradaxa. But the rest of this slide really particularly speaks to Coumadin therapy. So when you're thinking about a patient who needs to have some teaching about Coumadin or Warfarin, there's some things that they need to expect. They need to understand that, especially initially when they go on the medication, or if there's any um, dose changes, that they're going to frequently have their labs drawn. And that is going to be an INR. And so um, when they come in, they're going to look at their INR. And they should also know that they should expect frequent dose changes. So when we think about um, what will this patient need at home, well, they'll typically be sent home with a couple of different scripts. They might be sent home with a 10 milligram um, and maybe a five milligram tablet. And they'll have to have a pill cutter because it might be that they go home and on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they take 10 milligrams, but on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, they take 7.5. So then they would need to cut their 10 milligram tablet in half, so they have a five milligram tab, and then they take a 2.5 milligram tab. So they have to know that they're gonna need a pill cutter. They're gonna wanna make sure that they have a piece of paper um, or some kind of chart nearby. So when they're doing, when the, the provider's office calls, and it might be an NP or maybe even a medical assistant that's calling and giving them the dose change, that they write it down so they can clearly write it down and read it back to them so they um, have the right dose. Um, it's also important to let their pa your patients know that they should be taking this medication in the evening. And we take it in the eve we have them take it in the evening because in the morning is when they get their lab work drawn. And sometime in the afternoon before they take their evening dose, they will get the call from the provider about switching, uh, about potentially switching their medication dose. So we always want to take it in the evening. We, we don't want to impact the morning results and we want to be able to change the evening dose if needed. So when someone has a mechanical valve, generally speaking, the goal for the INR is to be somewhere between 2.5 and 3.5. Now that may vary slightly by provider or based on the patient and their other comorbidities. It might be the doctor wants them closer to 2.5, maybe they want them really at 3.5 or maybe even a tad bit higher. Um, but unless you know for sure what that provider wants, we would say that a general therapeutic range for an INR would be between 2.5 and 3.5. So if it is below 2.5, we would call them subtherapeutic, which means that their dose is too low and that they are at risk for developing a clot. If they're above 3.5, we would call them supra-therapeutic. And so that means that they are way too anticoagulated and then therefore run the risk of um, of bleeding um, and having other complications relating to blood loss. So this is important teaching for your patients. So remember, even if your patient doesn't have a, a mechanical valve replacement, uh, they may need Coumadin teaching because they may have history of AFib, um, they have valve disorder, so we're worried about blood pooling, um, they've got history of infective endocarditis and um, vegetations on the valves, things like that. So. Um, you may even find patients who ended up having a biological valve replacement also being on Coumadin. So that would be more for their other disease processes because remember, you don't need Coumadin for a biological valve, but that doesn't mean they couldn't still be on it. So just a couple of things that, um, to think about, but 
You'll want to remember this Coumadin teaching because not only do we talk about Coumadin when we talk about valve problems, but for AFib, a flutter, um, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. So Coumadin comes up in other, other problems as well. Thanks.